Okay. It's not quite 210, but I think we probably got everybody who's gonna come today since it is a very nice day outside, at least here. Um, how's everybody doing? People ready for grid search? You betcha. Can't wait. This okay. is uh, one of the, my favorite. This is one of the chapters I've been really looking forward to. Cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an important topic. So I have some notes from the chapter. We're just going to go through the chapter itself and touch on the key points. Uh, the TMWR supplementary material didn't particularly add that much that I found. Um, so I'm going to stick mostly to the chapter, with the exception of some stuff over here. I pull that up. Uh, and then I have a like a minimal version of something I've been working on for a while that has a more kind of like applicable grid search method in it that uses Latin hypercubes. And uh, I will we'll walk through that at the end for a little bit more in depth as to what can be done with grids. So grid search is for tuning hyperparameters. Uh, it is when you don't have a priori knowledge of a particular parameter. Um, sometimes you will, whether through domain knowledge or understanding of where the data comes from. You might have an idea of how to set some of these in advance, but otherwise, if not, you can use hyperparameter tuning to determine what the best, uh, you know, parameters are for the most accurate or, you know, highest sensitivity model. So regular and non-regular grids. Uh, regular grids are combined uh, different variables for the tuning parameters factorially using combinations of parameters for all of the sets. And the base function expand grid is one that does this. You give it different vectors and it creates every possible combination of those vectors. And as you might imagine, the more variables you add or the more, the longer each variable, uh, the longer the number of potential variables inside of a variable are, then it's multiplicative expansion uh, of the number of combinations that you would have to try. So it can get very computationally expensive very quickly with using regular grids. So we're going to be looking at the uh, multi-layer perceptron neural network, which has three tuning parameters, hidden units, which is the number of nodes in the network, the penalty, waiting penalty, and the number of epochs before, uh, I think it's like convergence happens. And you can create the model, we've already seen how to do that. Uh, the trace is just turning off more verbose reporting when the uh, model is training. And parameters is what creates uh, the different sets of parameters. And you can pull each parameter out with this pull dials object from the dials package. And so let's take a look at our MLP spec. Yeah, there it goes, too. So these are the default values that go in to each of these functions, hidden units, penalty, and epochs. And I say functions because the dials package has functions that are named identically to the parameters, the hyperparameters. And 
uh, I think for basically all of the models that come out of Parsnip, Dials has a function for it. And if it doesn't, there's a, a way of creating them with like new quants or new qual param, uh, both functions from the Dials package. And some of these are uh, transformed. There's a trans argument to the whatever the dials parameter object is, uh, function is, and it does a transformation to whatever values you uh, give to the range. So the crossing function in tidy R is how we can make regular grids. Uh, this is virtually the equivalent of expand grid from base, except it creates a tibble and doesn't automatically create factors. So if we give it three uh, hidden, one to three hidden units, either zero or 0 0.1 is the penalty, and then 100 or 200 as the epox, we have three times two times two, so we have 12 rows that will be um, kind of put into the model during training and tested to see how the model performs. So that is how a regular grid is created. You can also use the levels argument, uh, which will basically take two levels of each parameter and create combinations thereof. So you can modulate how many, if you have you know, a massive number and you just wanna do a couple of combinations, you can use fewer levels. And the levels function also accepts a named vector to choose how many levels you want in each one. So for hidden units, we can do three and it chooses one, five and 10, penalty two epochs and it'll create a, a grid for us. So there are also fractional factorial designs and so full factorial designs and you can look at the CRAN task view for experimental design. If you're interested in using some of those, that's something I have not explored because there are irregular grids and some are more logical than others. So grid random is the first one. And honestly, I don't know why you would do grid random. It uses a random number generator to create a grid of a size that you specify. And uh, this is the reason why there doesn't really make sense to use it is because across the range of possible parameters, you tend to have a lot of overlaps, like here, like numbers that are really close together. So you're training a model and running it and evaluating it twice for two sets of parameters that are like super close together. You're not really learning much uh, about where the optimal parameters are as you would be when you're comparing two that are much further apart. So, Space filling designs. There are Latin hypercubes and maximum entropy. And the reason those tend to be superior is visualized well in this graph right here uh, that shows how it tries to expand the hyperparameters into the space with the limitations of how many, um, what the size is of the, the grid set tries to expand into that space as much as possible such that you gather the most amount of information from the uh, parameters that you run through there. So it's kind of trying to optimize your computational processing there so you can more quickly hone in on what ranges of values are going to perform best. The default used by the tune package when you use like tune grid, if you just set the size and you give it parameters, will automatically use maximum entropy. So evaluating the grid to tune the grid, we use the 
uh, tuning grid function. This is just setting up a um, data set for us to use here. And it talks a little bit about what this data set demands. There's a high degree of correlation between predictors. So they're going to use PCA uh, to decorrelate the predictors. And since PCA is variance space, extreme values can have a detrimental effect on the calculations. So they're also adding a Yao Johnson transformation to each predictor. And here is the recipe. And you'll notice that piece step PCA also has a number of components, numcomp variable that it will be tuned as well. So we can take the workflow from earlier, uh, initialize the parameter set, and then update epochs. So we're going to use 50, a range from 50 to 20, and for numcomp, a range from 0 to 40. And because these are getting inserted as ranges in the like parameter functions, um, it's going to be ranges rather than just individual values. So at least I think that is the case. Yes, that is the case. So the tune grid function is probably the most important takeaway from this chapter. It's very similar to fit resamples in the way it functions. Uh, you can give it a grid that you custom made uh, with the grid argument or you can give it a number value, uh, an integer, and you can pass it either a list of params or a table of params, like a param, it's like a params object, and it will do a maximum entropy grid at the size that you pass to grid. So, Here we're using the ROC AUC and a tuning grid on the cell folds data set that was made and using the multi-layer perceptron network and a regular grid with three levels. And when you hit tuning grid, uh, that's your most computationally expensive step. And you will very quickly learn whether the number of um, the size of the tuning grid that you created is going to be feasible or not, because you'll be waiting for a really long time if you made a huge grid without realizing it. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, the way Tidy Models has create has made grid creation makes it a lot easier to control for that with very simple settings like size, and you don't have to like compute out your factorial model to figure out how to reduce down your set. So these are really helpful tools. Um, so that is the most expensive function. It's gonna pass in those rows of the tuning grid one by one to the model, to the data and, or the fold, and will measure your whatever metric and create results for you to examine. And there's an auto plot feature that allows you to examine these in a visual way. So we have the amount of regularization, which I believe is the weight penalty, uh, that, which is it's just called penalty, the penalty parameter. If I am wrong about that, somebody tell me, but I believe that's the penalty parameter, uh, which is 1, e, negative 05, negative 10, but we actually find that 1. Uh, across the board, this blue here is the best performing because we're, we're trying to optimize for the high end of ROC AUC. Uh, so it's pretty evident that this the higher regularization value is performs better. And then we can compare across epochs moving uh, horizontally, uh, vertically and then components moving horizontally. And so we can see that Components, uh, there's a slight increase um, at 20, but it starts out pretty high with just 
zero components over here. Um, and so that's you know going to be less computationally expensive. So there's probably no need to add more components since we're losing uh, we're losing predictive accuracy by adding them. And then for Epox, we can see that um, there is honestly not that much of an effect from the Epox either. Nothing particularly noticeable. The regularization is what seems to make the most difference uh, in in this for this particular data set. So that's a nice way to like examine your tuning parameters. And obviously, like if you use a a algorithm that has a lot more uh, tuning parameters, that graph can get kind of unruly. Um, I can show you that they use a slightly bigger one in the TMWR cohort one book club. And you can see what I mean by that. So <laughs> this is a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more unruly because there are more values to examine. And that is, or actually it's because they use more metrics here. So, uh, you know, there's, it's less easy to spot patterns when you start having a lot of parameters to look at. So no worries about that. There's a function called show best which allows you to pick out your best tuning parameters from the uh, set. So this is going to pick out the uh, combination, let's see, show best. Wait a sec, let me make sure I'm saying this right. Okay, yeah, so show best is gonna show you your best parameters uh, for the data set and the corresponding um, accuracy measures, whichever ones you, you chose, and which workflow in the config uh, column. And then based on these results, it would make sense to conduct another run of grid search with larger values of the weight decay penalty. It, does anybody know why that is? Uh, why they suggest doing this here? I think uh, it's Kevin. Uh, I was thinking because the value that performed the best was kind of at the upper and there's nothing above it. Uh, so you don't know if that's the best you could do. Um, it's kind of the boundary of the, of the parameters. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, exactly. I like paused on that statement for a while because I read it kind of quick and I was like, wait, why? And then, you know, looking back when you see the very top value that was used in your grid being obviously the best performer, that gives an indication that there might be a better performing value, uh, you know, continuing in that direction of the range. So we'd want to retune. Uh, with further into that range. So, um, and this is something I want to take into account in the demo that we'll uh, end with, but I have not done so yet. So this is another way to pass it in to the tuning grid function. You can just specify the, you want 20 combinations here and you can pass the parameters indirectly to param info, and it's gonna use the maximum entropy grid here. And the auto plot function uh, shows us how these, each parameter uh, performs. So as we add components, the RCA you see is there's, there's an obvious trend here uh, of not as good performance with the components. Epox is kind of all over the place, but it seems to really like start peaking out around 100. And then hidden units, there's definitely somewhat of a trend downward here. So we start off kind of low and then right around like three to five, three to six seems to be the optimal range. 
And then for the amount of regularization, um, that's interesting. I just noticed that. For the amount of regularization, the actually the, the one that's down here close to negative 10, but also the one that's closer up to zero are well performing. Uh, it's kind of interesting though, because when we look at this previous one, we actually found out that the amount of regularization was optimal around one, but during the maximum entropy design, we don't have values that high. Um, and it's telling us here that these are actually log transformed uh, when you get into the, uh, it actually puts a log transformed value in for that parameter when it trains, but what's pictured here is the values that you put in in their integer form. Um, so I, I think there might be like a one over here that is even higher performing than this, but it looks like this lower end might also have some good tuning parameters as well. Uh, ideally, if we were using these two methods in sequence like this, we would use what we learned up here from the performance on this regular grid, and we would create a new set of ranges, update the ranges in the parameter set based on what we learned, and then do our maximum grid or a maximum entropy grid based on the values from our first tuning. So we can kind of gradually improve. And this is called a marginal effects plot, which shows the relationship between each parameter and the performance metrics. Stephen. And again, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, d I'm, I don't know. Um, but just when you're saying that about that strangeness, it's not something to do with the fact it's been logged in one and not the other, maybe? Like, because log, log base 10 of 0 0.1 is minus one, so it's not, there's not something going on there, is there? I don't know. Let's see. So zero, so one to the zero, or one to negative 10. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not sure, but just that. I don't know if that I think might be something uh, Yeah, that's a good point. So this is the log transformed values here, it looks like. And then here is not the log transformed values. It's saying these are log transformed in the tuning grid. So the value that gets passed in is like, so it's saying this is log, this would be like one to the E negative 10, I think, log negative 10. And then this would be like one E zero here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, got it, that's right. Okay, cool. Yeah, that clarifies that then, yeah. So there's a high performing value over here near to one. And then there's, I guess there's one high performing value over here next to negative 10, but we can't compare exactly because it's this, uh, obviously this one is using different values than this maximum entropy. The maximum entropy is generating its own values, but the, the areas um, in the range, we can compare between the two. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, that, that clarifies that. Okay, so generally it's a good idea to evaluate the models over multiple metrics so that different aspects of the model fit are taken into account. Also, it often makes sense to choose a slightly suboptimal parameter combination that is associated with a simpler model. For this model, simplicity corresponds to larger penalty values and fewer hidden units. So the suboptimal parameter combination uh, if anybody wants to weigh in on this, the reasons I've heard for that is, well, if the model is simpler, it's going to take less computational time to run and uh, less space ultimately in the end. 
and also because the like hyper tuned hyper parameters might be overfitting um if anybody knows of any other reasons why they might say that oh crap uh then please let me know uh, sorry i hit a key combination i hit the back key combination all right so here we are and there's an extract option that you can pass to your control grid that allows you to retain your fitted models or your recipes uh, if you want to examine them in some way like if you want to since sometimes regression people want to look at the error error measures um, or whatnot, so you can you can capture those with the extract function there, and you can also set save pred to true and collect all your predictions if you want to look at those as well. So finalizing the model, uh, there is the select function, which uh, kind of like show best, which just shows you the best values select best uh, you can tell it how many you want to select and it will give you in this case the very top performing hyperparameter combination um, so you can using these values create a uh, a parameter grid and you can finalize the workflow with those parameters such that you have a workflow that's ready to go live and do some predictions with. And it can be fit to the entire set now. And if you did not use a workflow, it's finalized model or finalize recipe respectively, if you're just looking at those. So tools for efficient grid search, sub model optimization. So this is, these are parameters that you can tune by just building one model and predicting over and over again with different, um, with different values for this particular parameter instead of having to build a model for each uh, hyperparameter. And uh, when you use tuning grid and tidy models, it will tell you when it is, the first thing it will say is it'll give you a message that it is tuning that uh, particular value and it does it very rapidly. Um, it tunes that model to the data set and then the computational, you know, that, especially in the factorial design that will make the number of hyperparameters that you have to look at much lower if you can get one of those tuned very quickly and easily with just a single model build. And so fortunately for us, uh, everybody who worked on tiny models made it such that this is done automatically. Uh, so some of the ones, some of the different parameters that can be tuned are the mtry for boosting models um, for regularization methods like glmnet uh, simultaneous predictions across the amount of regularization so it can fine-tune the regularization through some model optimization and then mars uh, the number of non-linear features to add can be tuned as well and here's an example of this. So there's a 37 fold speed up with uh, C5, C5O classification model um, because the, um, I, th I guess it's the trees argument can be tuned via sub, sub model optimization. So that's neat. Uh, parallel processing, fun stuff, use all the cores. So this is basically what is set up 
with for each inside of tidy models here. So there's an outer loop that loops over the resamples, and then an inner loop that tries each of the different configurations, like your recipe model combinations in your workflow set. And you can specify with the parallel over argument uh, which to parallel over. And there's a little bit of um, uh, just like methodology to this. So the speed ups when pre-processing is not expensive um, are when you want to use uh, over everything. So if you have like a lot of workers, say here like 10 workers, you can parallel over everything and it will pass each uh, work, like each training thing, each workflow set with a corresponding recipe to each worker. And so it will do the recipe and it will do your training on each worker. Or you can do parallel over resamples which will pass it and it will be your recipe once to prepare the data. And then it will start doing your different tuning with your different hyperparameters, um, or sorry, your, with your different resamples over the, um, uh, wait, I got that wrong. So the resamples are passed to each of the workers and the, Pre-processing with the recipe happens once, and then the models are tuned with a couple of the hyperparameters on each one. Usually it's an even number is passed to each one. And yeah, normally you want to pay attention to how long your pre-processing takes, because if you have a really heavy pre-processing and you do parallel over everything, uh, it might actually slow down your computational process because each of these uh, recipe computations is taking much longer. So you just have to experiment with that and figure out which is gonna work the best to give you the best uh, speed ups. And in the demo at the very end, uh, I have a, there's a little bit of code in there that shows how to set up the parallel backend so you can parallel, use all your cores when you uh, compute in parallel. So these speedups can be uh, very large. Um, take a look at these here. So this is a benchmark with XGBoost with a data set of 4,000 samples using five-fold CV and 10 candidate models. Uh, all the pre-processing is done prior in a deep flyer pipeline. And then that's in the none uh, category. And then in the light, there's a, a fairly simple recipe. And then in the expensive, there's a high computational cost recipe. And so we can look here and look at the execution time. And so this shows pretty clearly that if you have relatively no pre-processing to do, as soon as you get to like 10 cores, uh, you're virtually on par with the um, parallel over resamples. And then once you have 15 to 20 cores, there's another like, you know, twofold speed up in time. This is about the same with the light, but then when it becomes expensive, we have a reversal of, of that trend where when you have an expensive recipe step, um, it's better to parallel over just the resamples because that is gonna be quite a bit quicker because you're running those resamples on every single, or those recipes on every single worker. And here's another graph of that looking at the speed ups. 
So what's the benefit of using submodel optimization in conjunction with parallel processing? Parallel computation took 13.3 seconds for a speed up of 7.5 fold. So that's 7.5 times faster. And between the submodel optimization and parallel processing, there is a speed up of 282 fold. So that's pretty massive. Um, especially when you have long, long compute times or you're trying multiple uh, machine learning algorithms and that's time consuming in and of itself. So racing methods, this I am less familiar with. Uh, it says it's akin to futility analysis in clinical trials. If a new drug is performing excessively poorly or well, it's potentially unethical to wait for the trial to finish to make a decision. Uh, so this is borrows from that logic and it is kind of a process of elimination where you eliminate the most poorly performing values that deviate from the best performing values by a full standard or a full confidence interval. Um, does anybody have experience with, with racing methods? Have anyone, has anybody done this before? I haven't done it, but I did watch Mac, Max's speech uh, um, at Studio Con about it. <clears throat> one of the things that he, um, I also saw a talk that he gave later on, and one of the things is that it's much quicker uh, than going over the grid search, or can be, but uh, and reduce computational time, which is great. But it also can have a tendency because it finishes early to miss out more optimal, um, more optimal choices. So um, it's a great method. It's not always the best. Interesting. That's good to know. Okay. So yeah, racing methods can be more efficient than basic grid search as long as the interim analysis is fast and some parameter settings have poor performance. It's also most helpful when the model does not have the ability to exploit submodel predictions. So that's kind of your use case there. And the function is from fine tune package tune race ANOVA. Uh, allows you to do this and there's a control race function to set specific parameters for your tuning. And the show best, it says n equals 10 here, but because this is erasing and it's just eliminating parameter combinations, it's only showing two because these are the only two that were left after the iterations completed. Yeah, so summary, there are the grid functions, grid random, grid Latin hypercube, grid max entropy. Uh, that allow you to create grids, or you can pass uh, an integer to size and pass a parameter object to param info, and it'll do max entropy directly in tuning grids, in tune grid function. And once you have parameters that perform well, then you can finalize the model uh, or finalize the workflow, whatever you're working with. And that's where you fit it. And then you're ready to go with some prediction on your test set. Okie dokie. So I've already run this because it's real computationally expensive. Well, at least on my computer, <laughs> took like all night long to run, but we can walk through some of the steps here. Uh, so this is a larger project that I, been working on. This is kind of a like reprex version of it. And it's it uses tuning grids in a unsupervised uh, manner because the, the object is to, to do this process for like 40 different data sets. Right now it's 40 different data sets. And so I can't particularly like evaluate by hand the tuning parameters. And so this is my best shot thus far at creating an unsupervised tuning process. Um, so this just loads data. Um, this loads a bunch of parameters. This is creating some windows of the number of observations 
that are allowable by the number of observations in the data set. Um, and so these are like windows. This is a time series. Uh, it's actually Spotify's uh, stock price from like, I think January of this year to middle of May this year. Uh, I can show it here so you can see what that looks like. So it's a it's a civil, which is a time series table, and it's by hour. And we are looking at as the outcome the change percent change over the course of a week. So we're going to see if we can predict uh, how this price movement is going to move. Um, in over the course of the week from the, the time we are predicting at. And this adds some moving averages. Um, so a moving average is just kind of a, a lagged um, average at a certain point in time. So like a, a moving average of 20 would take the last 20 values behind the point that you're looking at and would average those. And that would be the point. So this creates some um, moving averages over the windows here, windows of one day, which is seven uh, observations, one week, which is 35, one moon phase, which is 70, one moon cycle, which is 140. And then simple moving average is typically 200 days. So that's 1400 observations when you're looking at the number of hours that are available in this data set. You can see that the data runs from um, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So that's why it has those values. Uh, and then this just crosses those averages. So it, it literally just subtracts uh, one from the other. So I can show you what this looks like. So like this is a cross between an exponential moving average for the week and an exponential moving average for a moon phase. And so it just subtracts the two. So this gives, it's supposed to give a measure of like the relative momentum of a thing. If it's changed, if a time series is changing trend, it will move up away from its moving average. Um, if it's a positive trend, it'll move down below its moving average if it's in a negative trend. This is the general theory there. And so we're gonna see if we can predict what's going to happen over the course of a week um, by using these uh, like derived variables. So there inside of this function, I'm going to run this and we're just going to debug it so we can look at how the workflows are made. Okay, so can everybody see that? I know that looks intimidating, but <laughs> we'll step through it. So we're just getting the symbol and the, the time index. Uh, this is gathering a set of methods that we want to try out. So these are gonna be like the different combinations of workflows that, uh, of, sorry, ML algorithms that we wanna look at. So we're looking at XGBoost and an auto ARIMA XGBoost for model time. And so those are the methods that we're gonna try out. And the, we're predicting on the weak change. So we create a formula for that. And the recipe here, I wish it wrapped. I don't know why it's not wrapping, but the is that like a view thing or is it just because I'm debugging? Because it wraps in the source file. Uh, I don't know. That must be because it's like debugging. All right. Anyway, sorry about the non wrapping. But this recipe is fairly simple. It has a normalization of the outcomes, um, it omits. Uh, NA values for uh, 
a variable that's not actually in there for this particular example. Um, it removes a variable that isn't necessary for this. It removes all zero value predictors. It removes highly correlated nominal predictors. And then it uh, normalizes the nominal predictors. Um, and then something I found out the hard way is auto arima requires a time series object to be like a date or a date time in the data set so it can tune uh, the seasonal hyperparameters. Whereas XGBoost, just typical XGBoost, can't have any date or date time values. They all have to be numeric. And so this just removes the time series uh, value from the recipe in the recipe that's going to be used with XGBoost. And prep is used here. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, OK. <laughs> so prep is used here just to make sure that that recipe checks out. There are no errors. Um, and then this is mapping over our, um, our method list, our ML algorithms that we want to use. And what this is actually doing is it's creating a model. So this object um, method list is the actual functions from there. It's the functions from model 10 from parse step. And so these functions are getting passed in as a named object. And what this is doing is it is creating a model and then it's using this tune tunable function, which tells you all of the tunable hyperparameters for that particular model. So you can pass a recipe, a recipe step, a workflow, or a model specification, and it will give you all of the hyperparameters. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. Uh, just step down to it. Uh, actually, I can't get that out of there, but we'll see it anyway. That's what it does. And so it's taking, it's getting a list of all the hyperparameters, and then we are mapping over those names and we are setting each of those equal to tune so we're going to tune all of the hyperparameters here and then we're going to set the engine um, as the name of it I just set the names to the engine name so what this is doing is creating a bunch of models So we have these models here. It pulled out the different tuning parameters and it set tune as each of the um, parameters here. And something, if you, if you want to do this in one of your workflows, uh, just a weird thing that if you use exec, like Arlang exec or like do call, and you try to pass tune as the like value for each of these, it just doesn't work. It took me a long time to figure that out. You have to actually create it with call to, which creates an expression. And then you have to evaluate that expression to get tune placed as the value for each of these tuning parameters. Okay, so this next step creates parameters. And um, all the stuff in here that is not really relevant to this particular example is just saving tuning parameters from previous runs on this data set. The assumption being that like Spotify over time is going to have similar trends in how its price movement moves and thus tuning parameters from previous iterations uh, might be able to provide a narrowing of the range uh, when you when I'm running it again on future data and retuning it. Um, so it's not actually using that here. It's just going to use default values for parameters, um, which in this case, we don't have any older parameters to use. So we're going to pass null in for that, and it's going to use defaults. 
So create the workflow, and then we have to bind in the XGBoost workflow because it requires that special recipe. Um, so we use bind rows to do that. And then there is this uh, workflow set options add, and we can add our parameters into our models with walk per walk. And then we're gonna return the workflow set. So what this ends up doing is returning um, the workflow set. So we have the standard recipe with XGBoost, and then we have the standard recipe with the Auto Arena XGBoost and the corresponding workflows and uh, parameter sets here. So inside of here, uh, we're taking those windows and we're looking at what's the maximum window that fits on that data set and we're making a rolling origin sample. So this is, This thing, uh, not that one. That's right there. So we have this resample. Um, in this particular case though, I have used a cumulative true. So essentially what's happening here is we're using this and then we're using all of the data up to here and then all of the data up to here. And so it's just like, it's adding more and more data each time. Um, when, when that cumulative is set to true. And this initial, uh, this is from the resamples, the initial, I'm pretty sure, uh, just a review. The initial is the initial amount of uh, data observations that you want in a sample. And then skip is how many it skips before it starts the next resample. Um, and so we have a resampling uh, our sample object. This is just grabbing the package dependencies. And then we create our tuning grid. So that tuning grid is we're passing in the workflow set to workflow map. We're using tune grid as the method. We're passing in the resample. We're going to do 12 observations uh, or 12 combinations of hyperparameters by passing grid. And the, the parameter sets are already in the spot corresponding an info. We added that inside of the workflow thing with that last step that did the options add. So you can actually, when you create your workflows, you can add with that options add your parameters that you want. And it will use the corresponding parameters there for each uh, step in your, in your workflow set. And so it's going to use these workflows, um, these parameters that correspond to this model in the workflow, and it's gonna create a maximum entropy grid with 12 uh, combinations in it. And it's gonna use those 12 combinations over every single resample, and it's gonna do it in parallel. And I don't have many cores, so I just pretty much always do resamples because it doesn't make sense to do the other one. And then we're going to use the root mean squared error as our metric. And so I saved that. So we'll take a look at what that object looks like. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I have that out. Uh, we just, I don't know what it's called. All right, there it is. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, I had originally tried to use the profit, the Facebook algorithm, and it doesn't work yet. I don't know why. Um, I was going to post something about it on model time, but reprexes are always kind of intimidating. So I didn't do it. But yeah, well, this is loading up. Um, we're going to look at, we're going to rank the results to see which uh, algorithm worked the best. And um, we're going to rank it by metric is just RMSE. 
if you had a if you were using multiple metrics you could pass whatever metric you want to rank them by to this rank metric variable and then select best um, is going to just show you the best performing ones so okay it's loaded uh, ah. okay so let's look at that uh, we'll look at it in the viewer so so we have our two workflows and our mean uh, error term standard error and the model and the rank of them so we can pick out which one is the best and so we're going to do just that we're going to pick out that one uh, that workflow and then we're going to um, pull out the results for that particular workflow and then we're going to get the tunable hyperparameters from that workflow and then we are going to yeah the workflow set is this uh, okay so back to this okay So we can pull this out and we get the workflow that performed best, which was XGBoost. And then we can get the results. And we've got our result table here. And then we are going to look at what the um, tuning parameters are. And then we're gonna take the top performing um, hyperparameter combination for each of the resamples. Uh, and then we're gonna look at just the top five of that based on our metric. And we're gonna look at the top five tuning parameters. So these are going to, we can kind of examine those and see like where they are. And it looks like the top one is is right here. So if in that parameter set, if we map along it and it's not unanimous consent as to what the best tuning parameters are, because sometimes it is, sometimes the top five are the same set of tuning parameters every single time. So you just know that that's the one to go with. In this case, it's not the best, or we don't know exactly which is the best. And there's quite a bit of variability, as you can see here. And so we're gonna try to hone in with a uh, shorter run with just that model. So we're gonna make a time split and just use part of the data. Um, so it's gonna run a little faster and we're gonna do resamples on that and basically reiterate on the tuning uh, with the tune grid and create a new parameter set using these as the ranges. So we're gonna just use like range on each of the numeric values. And if there were any factors, we could just use unique on that. And we're gonna pass those as parameters to the tuning grid and do another maximum entropy tuning grid on just the algorithm that worked the best. And then we're gonna show the best and get the best uh, performing metrics and then we're going to update our workflow with those metrics and then we're going to update our model um, with the best performing parameters so let's look at the results uh, all right so is new data did i get that already no i did not okay so we're gonna pull some new data for Spotify and we're going to put the same 
uh, derived variables onto that data set. And we're going to fit our best performing model with the hyperparameters that did the best and predict, bind it together. This is all from the previous chapter and take a look at how it performs. So we've got some way off predictions. <laughs> This is like a percentage, so the root mean squared error is 0.95, the absolute error is 0 0.70, so like there's up to like 70% um, error uh, for our numeric predictions, uh, which is, that's quite a bit of error. But the good news is, if we look at the sign of our predictions compared to the actual values, we actually have an 89% uh, accuracy. And we can look at the, cover, the confusion matrix here. We actually have an 89% accuracy on the direction of the price movement. So we actually have a good chance of predicting whether it's going to be a positive trend or a negative trend, but we don't know how much uh, because those errors are, are pretty enormous. So yeah, that's a, a little demo using time series and kind of an unsupervised model training process. And I hope next week to learn about iterative grids because I think an iterative grid would work better here because we've already done max entropy. And if we just passed in those ranges into an iterative grid, we'd probably get a better value than just doing max entropy again. But I didn't know how to do that yet, so that, that's future work. Stephen, that was fucking amazing. <laughs> that was really, really good. I feel uh, like that probably is because I mean, you did the time series thing the other week. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. let's do some time series. <laughs> I think it's always nice to do time series because they don't really do it so much in um, in tidy models, but it exists because of Matt Dencho and Rob Hyman. Um, and it's just time series is complex, which is why, you know, it's not dealt with so much, but it's a really good business case. I think it's just really nice to see you really make the use of the whole uh, the whole of like what we've done there uh, it, it like really helps to see like your workflow as well in terms of your mind like you cognitively thinking through it and it's just yeah. like love how you pulled all of that out and really just like picked out the best model um i was just thinking like doesn't um model time do some of this stuff though or, like you know i mean it's great to code it all but i thought it did some of this there uh well <laughs> I wish I had known that. I need to look because if it does do some of this stuff, that's probably easier because that's easier to maintain if it's already, if some of this stuff is already automated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if they're maintaining that, I will take a look and see what they have as far as, as doing that with model time. I just found the like auto arima and the, um, the profit X2 boost. I didn't have any luck with the profit X2 boost, unfortunately. I was excited about that one. But yeah, yeah. Talk, talk that. me through that. How, like, wh what was um, what's the problem with X2 boost there? The profit X2 boost mm. needed a there's like a seasonality parameter. Yeah. And it was, I don't know if it's something I did or something they did. I need to like work back through my code, but it was like trying to use a function called logistic um it's like one of the tuning parameters logistic something or another in the while i was doing the workflow set and it just erred because it's like that's not a part of model time package and i don't know how that happened i looked through their code and i couldn't find any call to that function mm. so i think it might be something i did that i'm not aware of so i i have i'm i have a uh, intuition um that it might be how i call the 
functions out of the dials package for each of the tuning parameters, like the mm -hmm. way I create the parameters um, with this like custom parameter create function that I have. Uh, but I'm not certain of that. I need to look into it. Uh, but yeah, I will look into model time and see what all this they have done. Model time has um, a lot of stuff in it that you don't see on top of the surface um, and particularly isn't necessarily quite as well documented in some parts, but it exists. And once you know the system works really well, like if you do the business science course in time series, you learn there's so much in it. I'm, I'm only about 40% um, uh, through it, but um, there's a lot of things that, for instance, that I'd never seen online before. And then I started learning about since I started doing the course because like they don't like largely what an awful lot of what model time is, is kind of like it's created to build on model on tiny models. But also, you know, um, he doesn't like it's still quite a small group of people working on it. So Matt Bencho and like, you know, he's taken a lot of the stuff from um, what's it called? Tidyverse. Tidyverse? Um and then tried and implemented that into into his system, but yeah. it means that he hasn't necessarily got um, all the documentation out there for it. Even though there's quite a lot of you know information on how to do the basics, um, but you know if I get to it, um, I'll probably bring some of that up because I am working my way through it as fast as I can. To be honest, because it's amazing. Yeah, 